Well, welcome everybody. Um, a lot of a, a lot of familiar faces around around the room, but some uh, we I haven't met. So I just want to introduce myself. I'm Jane McNaughton. I'm senior research fellow here at the Institute for Medical Humanities, and I'm really thrilled to be introducing our speaker this evening, um, who is uh, Professor Karen Crosby. Um, and um, it's a really great personal pleasure. Karen and I have known each other for since the 2010s when That's we were right. working in the, we worked together um, on the Welcome uh, um, Expert Review Group for Medical Humanities and, um, you know, hustling about some of the applications and deciding on funding. Um, but more recently, it's been fantastic, we're working together uh, in a project led from the LSE on menopause, which is part of some of the work that we're planning to put out again, possibly for the Welcome project. I felt rather guilty asking Karen to come here because she's just taken on the position of head of school uh, of sociology and social policy at Leeds, where she's worked since 2013. But I really wanted to get her here and get her part of the IME family, so it's fantastic she's come. As well as the head of school, she's professor of gender studies at Leeds, but started life as a graduate in English from Oxford uh, and then moved to gender studies, first of all, at the LSE where she took her PhD in IVF failure, which was the subject of her first book. And a thing I've only just discovered about Karen when we're working together down in London is her passion for long distance swimming. And having just recently watched the film Nyad, which you must see about Diana Nyad, the long distance swimmer, who swam, what was it, 100 and how many miles was how far it? it? Cuba to Florida. From Cuba to Florida. Just an extraordinary, oh, no. extraordinary film. I'm filled with awe at the thought of anyone doing anything like that. But it's the most recent monograph that we're interested in tonight. This one, upside down, with a brilliant title, Super Rush. And uh, um, I really urge you to read it because as a West of Scotland child who spent my entire Saturday six months at the city counter mm -hmm. and then <laughs> been suffering the guilt of that with my fillings the rest of my life, it at least gave me some sense of assuaging that guilt that Karen has focused on other reasons why we might consume calories um, in to do with kind of pleasure and and, um, and the joy of, of eating. So we'll find much more to savor, I think, in Karen's presentation, which is the biopedagogies of sugar, self-knowledge, intervention, and the fantasy of liberation. Karen, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting me. And yes, although I am head of school, because I'm head of school, if I get to come out and do something like this, it's basically like having a week in Hawaii. <laughs> it's really exciting. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to talk about the book. Um, so if we think to that, the early 2010s, sugar su supplanted dietary fat as public health enemy number one. And it became the subject of a proliferating raft of newspaper articles, popular science books, self-help guides, and national and international policy, all urging us to give up the white stuff. So as Public Health England declared in the opening line of its 2015 paper on sugar reduction, we are eating oh I've got switch finger now. We are eating too much sugar and it's bad for our health. Sugar reduction, we're repeatedly promised, is a win-win which will boost individual well-being, reduce healthcare costs, and protect the NHS, if only people will do their part. One of the defining features of this attack on sugar is its framing as hidden in our foods and in our bodies. And this is exemplified by a short animation that some of you may have seen released by Change for Life in January 2019, which was to launch its Smart Swap campaign. Mm -hmm. In the film, angry cubes of sugar emerge from everyday <laughs> store cupboard, cupboard food packaging, rumbling menacingly and running amok in the family kitchen <laughs> to a horror soundtrack. The two children take cover from the onslaught behind their father, who desperately tries to fend off the attacking cues by swapping them with a frying pan until the day is saved by the appearance of their mother, <laughs> triumphantly brandishing two bags of shopping. A child's voice tells us, now mum's got an easy way to cut back on sugar with low sugar swaps on the things we eat every day. Empowered by her smart swaps, she whistles to the rampaging cubes who run obediently out the back door. <laughs> An adult female a voiceover at the end of the film urges, make a swap when you next shop. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to come back to the rather obvious gendering of this um, mm -hmm. later. 
So although it opens with a brief warning about the dangers of eating too much sugar, the film's focus is really on how sugar gets into our diets, beginning from a core feature of sugar's contemporary demonization, that it's not only hidden, but that it actively hides. Mm -hmm. It's an enemy that seeps unseen through the porous boundaries of the home and of our bodies, wreaking havoc as it goes. And consequently, the problem of sugar, if you understand it to be a problem, can't be resolved simply by choosing to stop consuming it. You have to be able to find it. Mm -hmm. The work of giving up sugar then is also the work of rooting it out. And this is a process that requires instruction. We're surrounded by information about how to eat, live, sleep, exercise in the name of health. And these life lessons aren't confined to the classroom or the clinic, but circulate across social, cultural, economic, political, and public health domains. And these are never purely informational, but instead aim to cultivate the good citizen, or more accurately, the good bio-citizen. That is a citizen whose primary obligation is to take responsibility for their own mm. physical well-being and make the right choices by um, informed by health expertise. And as such, these biopedagogies constitute lessons not only in what to eat or how much to exercise, but are also run through with virtue discourses, which establish certain behaviors and qualities as worthy and desirable, and which distinguish the good bio-citizen from the failing one. The Smart Swaps campaign then not only offers information about how to reduce a family's sugar consumption, but is also heavily laden with the normative expectation of behavior change, at least for mothers. So my talk today focuses on two aspects of these biopedagogies of sugar reduction. The first part explores what I've called the hidden sugar shop genre of newspaper reporting. So this is staged exposés designed to shock readers into realization and action. The second looks at the burgeoning genre of self-help books, which pick up where the sugar shop stories leave off, offering to guide readers expertly through the why and the detailed how of relinquishing sugar. And really what I want to argue is that the readiness to do the work of giving up sugar becomes a marker of the disciplined individual who's willing and able to take control of their life and body and who can't be seduced by false pleasures. It's become a fundamental statement about who we are. Before I get into that, I want to really briefly introduce the project um, on which this paper is based and, and on the book, which I'm going to now shamelessly promote again. Mm -hmm. um, Science, Politics and the Demonization of Fatness, very generously funded by the Leverhulme Fellowship, which I'm very um, grateful for. Um, I should also say that, I was, um, that the book was reviewed in the Sunday Times, uh, where it was described as vacuous and angry. Oh. Well done me. Um, I take it as a badge of honor. I quite want it on Martha's door. Yeah. So the research started with um, a search of newspaper coverage of sugar originally from 2000 to 2018, and then extended to October 2020 to try and capture some of the anti-obesity sentiment that sort of bubbled up in response to the pandemic. So I searched the archives of nine UK newspapers, including tabloids and broadsheets from across the political spectrum, for articles of over 500 words that had sugar in the headline. Then I filtered these manually to remove the irrelevant articles. So for example, the surprising number of references to Alan Sugar, <laughs> as well as recipes and metaphorical uses of sugar that you see in business pages quite a lot, a spoonful of sugar, sweetening the deal, yeah. those kinds of phrases. And so this was the result, this, this thing here, this chart here, was the result of that search. And as you can mm. see, that even though what, what's come to be called the war on obesity dates from the turn of the millennium, it's not until 2012 or 2013 that sugar's rise to prominence really takes off. And I'm not gonna talk about that. I haven't got time to discuss this in my paper now, but later in the discussion, we could talk about why I think that is, why, mm -hmm. why that happened then. It's actually quite significant in terms of my argument as a whole. But based on this pattern, the final data set then went from January, 2013 to October, 2020, and had a total of 556 articles. And as you can see here, they're not spread evenly across the newspapers. And this reflects not only different levels of interest in sugar stories from the readership um, across the newspapers, uh, but also different kinds of reporting. So the Guardian, for example, documented policy and regulation debates, particularly around the sugar tax, Whereas tabloids like the Daily Mail focus more on human interest stories, sugar shop stories, and shopping advice. So to this core data set, I then added research papers, press releases, popular science books, 
websites, autobiographies, TV shows, documentaries, lifestyle guides, and policy documents. Basically anything I could get my hands on that was about sugar. And this is the collective material that I used to write Sugar Rush. So just before I move on, I want to say just a few words about some of the difficulties of writing critically on this topic to try and preempt some of the most common challenges that I've encountered when I talk about this work. So there are two key challenges here. The first is the sugar confession. These are the responses mm -hmm. to my work. The first is the confession, where people offer up confessions of their own helplessness in the face of sugary foods, describing themselves as addicts, for example. At events where I've presented the research, people apologize to me for eating biscuits or cakes in front of me <laughs> and promise to do better tomorrow. <laughs> in these moments of heightened food anxiety, my own consumption then comes under scrutiny. Mm. As a vegan, I'm rarely able to eat the sweet snacks um, at events, but where I'm known as someone working on sugar, my non-consumption is repeatedly misread as sugar avoidance with the unspoken or sometimes spoken suspicion that I am hypocritically limiting my own sugar consumption while writing crit critically about others who are doing and advocating the same. And it's an assumption that's difficult to refute without then opening up the fresh can of worms that is veganism. Um, <laughs> but th this kind of mundane surveillance of the self and others in relation to sugar for me is a really useful reminder of the everyday struggles with food that many people and especially women have an experience and of the easy way in which guilt and shame and mm. worry about food and bodies trickle into our everyday interactions. The second response is the alarmed question, but you're not defending sugar, are you? Or another manifestation of the same impulse, but it is bad for you, isn't it? In this way, I find myself constantly pressed to concede the wrongness of sugar in exchange for engagement with my more critical analysis of sugar's fraught social life. I find this insistence absolutely fascinating mm. that we must all agree that it's bad before we can even begin to talk about the inequalities that are entrenched in such a claim. Within the familiar binary framing of food as either good or bad, asking critical questions about the attack on sugar is constantly misunderstood as me coming to sugar's defense. And my refusal to join the chorus of voices denouncing sugar risks placing me in dangerous alignment with the forces of big sugar. I'm asked repeatedly, for example, if Sugar Rush was funded by the sugar industry. Ah. Mm -hmm. ah. And this is an attempt to discredit, which fundamentally misunderstands my argument, as well as the funding landscape, where mm -hmm. even if I wanted it, which I don't, money is most certainly not flowing from the food industry to a feminist critical food and fat studies. <laughs> The biggest challenge then in writing the book has been to find a language to express critique mm -hmm. in a context where the terms of the debate are firmly entrenched in ways that forestall that critique before it's even mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. If I were to concede the terms of the debate, I would argue that as much as any food can be meaningfully categorized as good or bad, sugar is not especially healthful, but that approaches that measure food by its nutrient properties alone can't begin to capture food social meanings and values. Mm -hmm. Eating is never just swallowing and metabolizing food. It's a means of experiencing pleasure, sociality, love, comfort, community, and care. And I think of the walnut whip. My grandmother, mm -hmm. lovely Ooh. Nana T, um, <laughs> bought me and my brother one every Friday throughout my childhood. A nutrient-focused evaluation of the walnut whip <laughs> cannot begin to capture the emotions and meanings that I feel when I see one, even though I haven't eaten one for years. This dislocation of sugar from the social world in which it's consumed is a core problem, which the book aims to address. Consequently, I make no recommendations about what people should or shouldn't eat, and nor do I accept or make use of categorizations of food as good or bad. And this is frustrating to some people, I know, but it creates a space or it aims to create a space to ask, what work sugar and its repudiation is performing in the social world and in, in whose interests. So with that in mind, let's move on now to think about one of the key mechanisms through which dietary sugar is constructed as hidden or hiding the hidden sugar shop story. One of the characteristics of sugar as a food stuff is that it's rarely consumed on its own and is more commonly combined with other foods, for example, to act as a sweetener, 
or a preservative or providing palatable texture. Home consumption of store-covered granulated sugar, for example, for baking, mm. receives relatively little attention from anti-sugar mm. campaigns. Instead, the primary focus of the attack is on processed foods to which sugar is, to which added sugar is integral, but not self-evidently visible. And the hidden sugar shock story um, is a staged exposure expose of this sugar. And this is just some, some sample headlines mm -hmm. in particular from um, the Daily Mail, this, this one is from from the Guardian. In the period covered by this research, hidden sugar shock stories were uh, primarily instigated by the campaigning organization Action on Sugar, who were launched in 2014. They had the, the strap line that sugar is the new tobacco. Um, and what they, these serve, what they do, these stories, cover the array of obviously sugary foods, including things like energy drinks, coffee shop cakes, chocolate spreads, muffins, milkshakes, waffles, and festive hot drinks. And at first glance, these may seem like unlikely targets for stories about hidden sugar, that they're so obviously sugary. Um, but nevertheless, they dominate the hidden sugar shock genre, with the shock value lying not in the presence of sugar for, per se, but in the unexpectedly high quantity of sugar present in it, making for imp impactful headlines. And this, as much as this structure of as much as, as much sugar as a bowl of Frosties, as much sugar as three cans of Coke, 49 mm. chocolate fingers. This is a kind of pattern that, that, that the, launches these stories to make it legible. Um, the genre is exemplified by a campaign launched by Action on Sugar in November 2018 against high sugar milkshakes. Based on a survey of out of home and supermarket shakes, Action on Sugar grabbed media attention by offering up a spectacular worst offender, oh. the freak shake. Freak shakes yeah. are excessive concoctions of milkshake, ice cream, sweets, cookies, and cakes, or what the Sun described in his day two coverage of the story, a mega milkshake mashup of a drink <laughs> and a pudding. The most extravagant freak shakes contain well over a thousand calories and over 30 teaspoons of sugar and the recommended daily amount, um, and we could talk a lot about how that number's been arrived at, but is seven, seven teaspoons is the, the guidance. Yeah. The enthusiastic media coverage made the most of the spectacle, decorating reporting with lurid images of these brightly colored shakes covered in chocolatey sauces and sugary toppings. The campaign and its subsequent media coverage focused on products sold by the Harvester and Toby Carberry, Carberry chains, both of which catered to a working mm. class demographic. The day after the campaign launched to keep the story alive, Action on Sugar tweeted that daily consumption of freak shakes by children would cause tooth decay and obesity, but they offered absolutely no evidence of how frequently these are consumed and by whom. So for example, at over five pounds, well over five pounds per shake, it's highly unlikely that children are consuming these daily on the way home from school. Furthermore, Action on Sugar's hyperventilating horror can't account for the sociality of eating, the possibility that friends might club together with multiple spoons mm -hmm. to share a treat. Mm -hmm. Regardless of whether this campaign was intended seriously or whether it was simply a piece of headline grabbing fun, the underlying message is very clear that working class people are dietarily incontinent in the face of sugary foods. And as such, they have to be protected from themselves, in this case, by banning the most excessive as the campaign wants to do with mm -hmm. freak shakes and placing calorie limits of 300 calories on all other milkshake products. Just as a war on obesity um, inevitably becomes a war on those categorized as obese. When we make enemies of particular foods, we make enemies of the people presumed to eat those foods with hierarchies of taste setting up class distinctions between us and them. A second strand of the hidden sugar shock story comes in the form of what I've called the mortified mother genre of news reporting. And again, this is just a couple of sample headlines. And in these, family sugar consumption is calculated and then mothers are subjected to evaluation and correction by an expert, as you see in this kind of type of headline. So, for example, in February 2017, and this is the, the article on the right here, The Sun published an article where mother of three Gemma responded to a nutritionist's evaluation of her children's daily diet. So she says, I'm really surprised and shocked by how much sugar all the children have been eating. It's a real eye opener. I always thought cereal bars were a good option, but I've already started making thinly toast and porridge. 
I was told to put Macy on a high calorie diet when she was a baby, but it's my fault she's ended up on a high sugar one. I'm going to make sure she eats a lot more nutritious foods. All the kids love spaghetti bolognese. Since doing the diary, I started making my own pasta sauce. I've started shopping online as the nutritional information is easier to see and add up, which is making a difference. We switch from fizzy, um, full fizzy drinks to diet. Unlike the dramatic excess of the freak shake, the impact of the mortified mother story lies in the shock, not of quantity, but of accumulation. Mm. With small quantities of hidden sugar, hidden added sugar, often in savory foods where you might not otherwise expect to mm. find them or in foods that have been coded as healthy, for example, and these mount up unseen during the day. And while the stories about obviously sugary food frequently play on class assumptions of incontinence and instant gratification, as with the freak shakes, for example, these stories rest on correctable error, seething maternal guilt mm. and the unseen work of women. For the reformed Gemma, sugar reduction generates significant additional domestic labor, mm. cooking from scratch, reading nutritional information and calculating and recording consumption by the teaspoon and the gram for each family member. But this is cast as part of her maternal duty and therefore as pleasurable, being a good mother, acquiring new culinary skills. So throughout my project and across every single data source that I looked at, I never once saw similar articles targeting fathers or including the redistribution of domestic labor as part of the lifestyle advice given. So while men dominate the anti-sugar domain as the voices of authority, it's women who are the movement's unspoken workhorses. They're brought sharply into focus when they come up short, but they become invisible as food workers through the recasting of work as gendered leisure. So as such, my point here is not that women's work is simply hidden, but that it's been naturalized into invisibility. This cultivates a sense of ease and simplicity around sugar reduction that raises the stakes for those who are seen as not complying. The accusatory question hangs in the air, where it's more pleasure than work, what kind of mother would not do it? Mm. And I'm going to return again to some of this gendering when I look at the self-help works. These sugar stock stories are just the beginning, and particularly for those who want to relinquish sugar entirely from their diets rather than just reduce it, the process is framed as requiring extensive work on the self. So as part of the Sugar Rush project, I focused on nine books, all self-help books, all broadly within the self-help genre, which promise to guide readers to liberate them from the grip of sugar. And these are kind of indicative rather than a definitive list of books. They're very different types of books. These, these, so this includes books that are kind of within the wellness genre. And I know that the, the Four Dummies one doesn't look like a wellness text, but it uses the language of mindfulness and so on quite a lot. These are more classically sort of wellness or a glossy wellness text. We've also got these kind of highly programmatic um, texts that demand step-by-step -step mm -hmm. obedience, often due to a system that's been applied to many mm -hmm. other things like smoking and gambling and so on. Um, then we've got these textually dense accounts that present detailed kind of popular science informed descriptions of the dangers of sugar um, as a justification for the, for the for giving it up. And then we get these autobiographical accounts that sort of my year of um, no sugar style of book where they document their own motivations and struggles, triumphs, and they're intended to be entertaining, but also always didactic. Um, and they're very different, but as I'm going to go on to explain, they're, they're remarkably similar in their kind of content and overarching message. So central to the project in all of these books, central to the project of giving up sugar is simplicity. With authors boasting of programs, quote, without gimmicks or special diets, of not having to count points or calories, of incorporating no shakes, no pills, no off-limits food groups. Uh, David Gillespie, for example, um, says of the Quick Sweet Poison Quit Plan, it's not a diet book with simple presumptions and complex rules. It's an anti-diet book with detailed evidence, but simple rules. And this is encapsulated in what he calls his super rule for giving up sugar. <laughs> Don't eat sugar. Mm -hmm. This appeal to simplicity is shored up with bullet points, points and pointed and numbered lists of rules or steps which simultaneously invoke obedience and autonomous choice. 
So for example, in an echo of the 12 steps recovery programs like AA and in line with his heavily structured and trademarked easy way um, system, Alan Carr's plan is built around 12 key instructions, the first of which is follow the instructions. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, the rules or steps are, are really difficult to distinguish from generic dietary advice that they emphatically then distance themselves from, as well as from each other. So they all have to carve out a kind of individual marketable position that are all actually incredibly similar. So things like um, only eat when you're hungry, get enough sleep, drink lots of water, exercising, avoiding simple carbohydrates end up being central pillars. And most of these lists also include some form of attitudinal or emotional um, self-management. For example, Gillespie's first rule is to have the right attitude. The physio instructs readers to avoid boredom. And Carr insists that readers should never doubt the decision to quit. But for all their mundanity, the liberation that they promise is spectacular. And all the self-help guides include a, a kind of dietary reset that aims to break sugar's hold on the body and liberate them. So take this promise from David Gillespie. He's talking about this act of, of giving, of quitting, of going cold turkey, as he calls it. This won't be fun, but starting it half the battle, hold the line, there's no moderation, you've stopped poisoning yourself. If you can just get past the first few weeks of danger, you'll enjoy the health sugar has sucked from your life to date. Then all of a sudden your desire for sugar will vanish. I know it will sound strange, but it just goes bang. These promises rest on an understanding of sugar, not simply as a source of empty calories, but as toxic in its own right, creating metabolic devastation in ways that are not immediately visible from the outside. So as flamboyant anti-sugar author Robert Lustig warns menacingly to people who are slim, but still eating sugar, you think you're safe, you are so free and you don't even know it. So once this reset has been achieved, readers are promised the unsustainable control that dieting demands through the exercise of willpower will no longer be necessary. This is why it's not a diet. This reproduces the central pillar of the anti-sugar self-help domain, that the work of liberation from sugar falls to the individual and that ill health mm -hmm. is a personal choice. As Sarah Wilson observes in relation to her own decision to quit sugar, these things are always a matter of choosing and committing. Fundamental to these exhortations to individual choice and responsibility is the conviction that below the chaos of sugar's metabolic disruption, there is a real self hidden beneath the devastations of sugar, whose appetites are naturally oriented towards healthful sugar-free consumption. Mm -hmm. Readers are urged to reclaim this true self mm -hmm. by undertaking time-limited sugar-free challenges that will, and these are all words that come from the books, wipe the slate clean, establish a clean canvas, reset your fullness signal, mm -hmm. allow the body to recalibrate, give your body a fresh start, restore natural homeostasis and natural instinct. These exhortations presume the latent presence of an authentically pristine body, uncontaminated by modernity, that's robustly healthy and whose imagined appetite and dietary needs are universal and predictable. And what's really interesting for me here is that in these models, sugar is the only disruptor. So we don't hear anything about um, pollution, sort mm -hmm. of um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, stress, and so on. It's only sugar that is seen as affecting the metabolism. So this first stage of wiping the slate clean is the primary site of struggle in the books. But once the body has reset, the rewards flow, offering a tantalizing dietary fantasy of being able to eat whatever you want because you will only want to eat good food. Gillespie prom as Gillespie promises, and this is a quote, once your sugar addiction is broken, a triple layer chocolate cake sitting next to your cuppa will not be the remotest bit tempting. It's a model that ens um, ensures the erasure of social, economic, or cultural influences on food choice which are all sublimated to a kind of universal, natural, biological drive. But even so, the class presumptions underpinning these discourses of restoration seep through. So, for example, Eve Schaub, who wrote one of the autobiographical accounts of giving up sugar, describes her experience of eating cookies or some chocolate once her year of sugar was over. And she says, I realized after a moment that my mouth felt funny, cloying, overly sweet, like I just drank a whole glass of maple syrup. A few minutes have passed and I feel a headachey feeling. 
creeping around the base of my brain, followed by a weird energized feeling, a, a sugar buzz, if you will. Sugar heavy foods here figure not as without taste, but as having a blunt excess of taste. And in this way, the anticipated changes in taste after quitting sugar also mark a transition to becoming tasteful, exposing the class foundations of this sugar-free life. So for example, after her year of no sugar, Schaub explains her enjoyment of things with a much subtler sweetness, declaring proudly that sodas, ice cream sundaes, carnival cotton candy, all now strike me as slightly gross. Mm. For Gillespie, this transformation in taste literally renders him a connoisseur, boasting excitedly that I could really tell the difference between Cabernet Sauvignon and Shiraz, whereas before it had all just tasted like wine. <laughs> the consumption of sugary, heavily processed foods then is in poor taste, becoming a marker of uncontained, thoughtless eating with crude, excessive, effortless sweetness, signaling a lack of refinement and impatience for pleasure. Conversely, the sugar-free consumer is discerning in search of subtle and exotic taste experiences to be enjoyed slowly and from quality foods. And this class transformation exemplifies the ways in which giving up sugar makes a positive claim about who you are. In this case, a responsible and tasteful middle-class subject who is reaping the just rewards of bodily control. In line with the expansive promises of the self-help genre more generally, these transformations in appetite control and tasteful moderation are just the beginning of the promised freedoms and pleasures of the sugar-free life. Set against the Wonder Woman cartoon figure, Elsa Jones claims that by the end of her 10-day sugar-free challenge, you'll feel clean, empowered, and in control. And Dan DeFigio argues that a simple sugar detox can, quote, improve your mental clarity and lead you to a more empowered and fulfilled life. Now, the content of that category of, un of empowerment is completely unspecified in these claims, but it signals a kind of generalized self-efficacy that's presumed to carry into all aspects of life. So DeFigio, for example, sees giving up sugar as a step towards, quote, creating or improving other positive things in your life, such as relationships, exercise, career issues, time management, and self-care. Mm. The sugar-free life is also a hyper-productive one. Paul McKenna mm -hmm. promises a reduction in idle thoughts. And for Alan Carr, this is a quote, work will become more enjoyable and you'll become better at what you do from oh. giving up sugar. <laughs> so free from sugar, you make your own luck and the world is your oyster bank, as Gillespie says. So tantalizing as though they are though, there's a tension here at the heart of these promised transformations. On one hand, um, on the one hand, claims to simplicity allow for their presentation as verging on the miraculous with just a few days or weeks of struggle resolving into a blissful state of tasteful appetite control. But on the other hand, the privileged reader is one who is prepared to take responsibility for health by putting in the requisite work. And one way in which this is resolved is through the representation of the transformation, the work of transformation as effortless. It's not that there's no work involved, but that it doesn't feel like work. As cultural sociologist Mickey McGee describes it, it is, quote, effortless effort, passive activity, and endless work imagined as effortless exertion. The self of the self-help genre is endlessly, in, if invisibly, belabored, to use McGee's term, requiring relentless hidden work to create and sustain the newly invented self in the face of its own inefficiencies. Mm. There are practical aspects to this work, such as, for example, clearing out your kitchen cupboards, and restocking with sugar-free foods, which all of them sort of insist on at the start of the process. So for example, in a, in a magnificently unreflexive display of fast tastefulness, Mowbray urges her readers to quote, go wild in the aisles and discover new things, describing encounters with buckwheat groats, cocoa nibs, and emerald green, rich buttery tasting queen olive, the size of walnuts that will test your, set your taste buds a quiver as well as recommending what she calls hero products that will bring a touch of glamour to your larder, including coconut oil, nut butters, quinoa flakes, avocado, and smoked salmon. But there's also the work of self-knowledge in the form of relentless quizzes, journals, and reflexive exercises. The quizzes are usually at the beginning of the books, providing opportunities for readers to identify their own deficiencies and symptoms, and therefore as needing the advice which follows, drawing them into the book and into an imagined community of readers engaging with the process. 
So for example, Defigio offers a series of quizzes under the heading, what kind of sweet freak are you? That include both physical symptoms, do you get headaches, do you wake up tired, and emotional ones, do you gossip or talk about others behind their backs? Do you feel, do you feel depressed and hopeless? Um, in the same vein, Elsa Jones asked, are your sugar cravings out of control and are you ready and willing to change? The quiz leads readers quickly to the right answer, affirming their need to keep reading. And sugar, as we've already seen, is held culpable for every possible physical, social, social and emotional dysfunction. And answering yes to even one of Jones's quiz, quiz questions about sugar cravings means that, quote, you are likely to benefit from reading this book. These diagnostic tests give way to further extra textual work that reaches beyond the initial challenge period and aims to equip the reader with the skills to continue their self-invention um, after finishing the book. The miraculous vanishing of the desire for sweetness, it turns out, is always precarious and self-knowledge is positioned as the only way to avoid repeating mistakes and falling back into old habits and behaviors. In this way, the real me to which the sugar abstainer is presumed to return is also a new me that requires new skills and insights to fend off the temptations of sugar. So for example, Jones um, concludes each chapter of the book with a reflective exercise under the heading, what are you thinking? And this aims to preempt any negative thoughts that might be interfering with the process. So for example, the negative unhelpful thought that I don't want I don't want to make changes to my schedule. I'm busy enough as it is, is recast as I'm willing to do whatever it takes to succeed, even if it requires initial sacrifice. Being slim and healthy is worth it to me. So what we can see here is concerns around time and capacity are quickly discredited, reducing success to a matter of motivational choice and careful strategy, strategizing. So another core prescribed activity here is journaling. The act of journaling serves multiple purposes and is, a, if, if you ever read any self-help books, it's mm -hmm. an absolute staple of the self-help and wellness genres. So Jones recommends keeping a food and mood journal to identify eating triggers, while for Defigio, a food journal also acts as a lie detector. And, and what he says is, if you bite it, write it. Um, these journaling tasks expose the limits of the book, which present themselves as the answer to the problem while at the same time insisting that readers will need to look beyond the book if they are to succeed. So the texts appear self-sufficient and necessary, but are ultimately insufficient, and the reader ends up being both the problem and the solution. McGee argues that this work of authoring the self is a trap, whereby the newly emerging authentic self must be constantly at work on itself, and that the journals that the readers keep are not a simple memoir of experience, but rather are a form of ongoing labor that is part of a process without end. Furthermore, it's never enough sim simply to recognize your own failings in the journal, but readers have to take recuperative action. Negative thoughts must be replaced with positive ones, bad eating habits must be reformed, and constraints in time and money must be circumvented through smart self-management. And the word smart comes up all the time in the anti-sugar domain, which I, th I find quite disturbing, that idea of smart swaps because of the implication of those who then do not make those moves. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very troubling way that we frame it. So these um, unimaginative and unforgiving prescriptions highlight the ways in which the writing tasks offer a prescribed language to ensure that readers remain within the bounds of good neoliberal dietary bio-citizenship on which the books themselves are premised. But while the preparatory and ongoing work of giving sugar is addressed in great detail in these texts, there is no discussion about who performs this labor of label reading, planning, reflecting, shopping, and cooking, which is inescapably coded as the work of women, even, even though the books are kind of rather disingenuously gender neutral. Um, so as we saw in the case of Gemma earlier, one way of achieving this is through recasting domestic labor as leisure, the effortless effort that McGee talks about and, and we see this with Paul McKenna, for example. He says, as you move away from sugar, you'll, you'll find at first that you spend a bit more time finding foods without sugar. You may start cooking differently or cooking more often. You may spend an extra minute or two peeling fruit and having to wash your hands instead of just opening a carton of juice. Of course, once you've established your new routines and found better food to buy or cook, 
it won't seem like an effort at all. You may discover that you enjoy it more. The reduction of the labor of going sugar-free to a few minutes of fruit peeling and hand washing willfully obscures the extensive time and effort involved. Instead, McKenna articulates a patriarchal fantasy of primarily women's unpaid labor as too pleasurable for it even to be classed as work, while stopping well short of suggesting the redistribution of that labor or that it has brought any new joy to his own life. As Mickey McGee observes of the belabored self, this is a quote, work is reimagined not as a deprivation for which one ought to be compensated, but as a means of expressing oneself as a source of identity and personal fulfillment. Mobilizing the same logics that see smart money management as a means of getting around financial limitations, and we've seen this in the case of austerity and the cost of living crisis, you just have to manage your money better. Mm. Um, we see um, time, or the lack of it, is equally a matter of careful economy and micro-efficiencies that require no structural or fundamental change in the organization of everyday life. Jones, for example, urges readers to create time to succeed. She presents the case of Susan, who divides up her daily tasks into essential and desirable to help her prioritize. Susan, we're told, creates time for her new sugar-free eating plan with some clever problem solving and delegating. She starts getting up 10 minutes earlier to make a healthy packed lunch and then asks her husband to take over her daughter's bedtime routine on weeknights which meant that she had an extra 15 minutes every evening to plan meals for the next day and write her shopping list. The micro economies of finding time mirror those of sugar reduction, where savings are passed by the teaspoon and the gram by the mortified mothers. So by finding 10 minutes here and 15 minutes there, she squeezes her new eating plan into her packed day. But this is not creating time, right? Um, Instead, the labor of sugar-free food preparation eats into her sleep time. And while the bedtime routine is passed to her husband, the work of delegation still lies with Susan and the transfer of the task simply opens up a sliver of time for yet more work. The work of giving up sugar then is not only without end, but it's also unevenly distributed in ways that allow for its categorization as not work and its dislocating from the uneven social relations and structures, uh, and structures that frame everyday food work. So some conclusions, and I've got my friendly angry sugar cubes again. Sugar is widely conceptualized as an animated threat to health that lurks <clears throat> hidden in our familiar foods. Its effects are understood not only as externally visible, for example, in body fat, but also as hidden internally in the form of unseen metabolic disruption and appetite dysregulation. The normative work of giving up sugar then in the first instance is the work of raising alarm. And we see this um, in the hidden sugar shop genre of news reporting with exposés designed to shock readers out of apathy and into action. In the wake of these punchy, melodramatic anti-sugar stories, we find the more carefully paced and detailed book length manuals for becoming the good sugar-free citizen. They're founded on the expectation that the management of food, health, and the body are the responsibility of the individual, and that we make our own luck with the choices that we make and how smartly we navigate our busy day and our budgets. But expert advice is needed to marshal this transformation, and the books brook no excuses. Um, armed with the necessary information, the winners rise to the challenge, while the losers fall by the wayside. The resolutely classed and gendered expectations of this work are quietly hidden in the process, with the focus firmly on food choices rather than political choices. This positions the sugar-free life as an act of self-making. Rather than an expression of existing privilege, it becomes a testimony to the willingness of the individual to take responsibility, exercise control over the body, defer pleasure, act on expert advice rather than impulse, and to consume tastefully. In doing so, readers can distance themselves from the feckless, over-consuming other whose abjection hangs quietly and sometimes not so quietly in the air, surrounding every exhortation to transform both the diet and by extension the self. For me, this signals the need for new points of departure, including the foregrounding of new voices, those more spoken about than speaking, since to leave the task of articulating the problem of sugar to those who are already best positioned to accrue capital 
through its repudiation is always to risk sedimenting health and social inequalities rather mm -hmm. than ameliorating them. So in turn, this involves refusing the comforting sense of individual control and self-transformation that comes with sugar restriction in, the, in favor of something much more unsettling and socially transformative. Thank mm. you very much for listening. Mm. Well, thanks very much, Karen. That was brilliant. And just on uh, IMH's theme of hidden experience, I mean, this fantastic <laughs> notion that, you know, sugar is sitting there hiding, waiting to kind of come out and, and, uh, and control our our naturally clean bodies. I mean, it's it's an extraordinary kind of idea um, about it having almost like it's having its own agency. And um, it's been such a pleasure to have you here, Karen. I think the it's raised so many resonances. I think with obviously with our certain our, our central theme here, but also with work, for example, that you've done in the breath project on tobacco and the kind of tobacco mm -hmm. as an as an agent in the world, mm -hmm. causing its mm -hmm. uh, the whole kind of issue of addiction. Which has come up through sugar in a very different way. Mm. The kind of blaming of women for not cooking things from the from, from scratch and into the whole kind of uh, culture around that. So lots of things for us to take away and reflect upon. And um, thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.